Hello and welcome to our midweek, midweek Bible study this week. By way of announcement, we remind you that our in-person prayer meeting is at 7.30pm on Wednesday evening in the church halls and our Zoom prayer meeting the same evening via Zoom at 8.15pm. Please contact Albert for sign-in details. Before we turn to our study, let us first commit our time to God and pray. Let us pray. Father God, we do thank you for the opportunity to gather around your word and to hear you speak. We thank you that you're not a God who stands far off and is distant, but a God who comes intimately close to reveal yourself to us, to reveal who you are, to reveal what you do for us, and to reveal what is expected of us in return. We thank you that we are saved by grace through faith, but that faith must be accompanied by works that show our appreciation of your lavish grace. So Father, we pray that you would help us now to hear you speak and then to be obedient to your calling. Father, please help us to honour and glorify you in our time together. In Jesus' name, Amen. So this week again we continue our studies in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Paul may have had to leave the Thessalonians rather hastily, but he certainly had not left them behind in his heart. And our passage tonight continues in a section of the letter that reveals Paul's deep love for this new church and his ongoing concern for them. Paul viewed the Thessalonians as part of his family and in this section we see all the natural concerns that parents tend to have for their children. We also need to recognise that there that in this passage there is mutual encouragement. Paul certainly wants to strengthen and encourage these new believers but on hearing the latest news from Timothy we shall see that the great apostle himself is encouraged by them. So in this passage we can have some rich material to inform us and our understanding of the role of the church in the life of the believer. So let us turn to God's word and we'll turn this evening to 1 Thessalonians and begin at chapter 3 verse 17. But our focus will be in chapter 3 and verses 6 to 13. So uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 17 to 3 verse 13. And let us hear God's word to us now. Let us read God's word. But brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be, to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker, in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that you would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and, and our efforts might have been useless. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have present memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you too. Therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself, our Lord Jesus Christ, clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen you and strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all his holy ones. And we thank God for this reading of his word. So, I imagine that if you were to ask the average person what their impression of the Apostle Paul was, you would get a variety of answers. 
I'm sure most would be aware of his road to Damascus experience on some level, uh, and that he wrote a large chunk of the New Testament. Others with a particular agenda may want to argue that he was anti-woman or anti-gay or anti-Jew, but none of these accusations stand up under true scrutiny. One of the things about Paul which would probably be further down the list of things we know about Paul would be his deep compassion and love for the believers in the churches that he planted. And yet, yet you can't read his letters to the Corinthians, for example, without seeing how much he cared and loved them, despite how they treated him. And in Thessalonians, we've already noted how much this letter is filled with affectionate terms and with concerted attempts to underline his care for these believers. Paul was a man of deep pastoral concern and Christ-like love for those with whom he shared the gospel. We see this again in our passage this week. Remember, Paul had been facing criticism for his sudden departure from Thessalonica. In chapters 2 to 3, he answers such criticisms and provides assurance to the Thessalonians. In verses 1 to 16, he has already reminded them of his pastoral ministry while he was present with them. Then in the verses we've just read, we see his great concern whilst he is absent from them and his desire to be with them. Paul's other concern is that he, he is aware of the persecution of this young church. And therefore he wants to encourage and strengthen them in their sufferings, which is how he came to the decision to send Timothy to them. It is in this context that we come to understand what Paul says in verses 6 to 10 of chapter 3. Here we read of Paul's reaction to the news about, about them brought back by Timothy. Paul is filled with deep love and joy uh, that reveals his pastoral heart and deep concern for God's people. And in verses 11 to 13, this joyful thanksgiving gives way to prayerful concern for the believers. Paul, like any pastor, is concerned that the believers go on with Christ, even in the face of difficulty. So in our passage, we learn of Paul's pastoral heart and Paul's pastoral prayer. Here we see that being part of the church involves rich relationships, which should provide encouragement and support to each other within the church. And we also see that growth and development should be a normal feature of the Christian life as believers pray for and fellowship with each other. So we are called to remember that, that we need the church and each other. The Christian faith is about pursuing Christ and holiness together through prayer and fellowship. We see this first day as we consider Paul's pastoral heart. We live in a world of instant communication, Zoom, FaceTime, WhatsApp and everything else. A, a world where you can talk to a loved one on the other side of the world in a matter of moments. A loved one who is unwell, a child away at university or a friend we haven't heard from in a while can all be contacted very quickly. Straight away we can hear how they're keeping, see how classes are going and get the latest update about how life is going for them. This was not the case for the Apostle Paul and the Thessalonians. And Paul was deeply burdened by the fact that he couldn't visit the believers. In verses 1 and 5 of chapter 3, he says he couldn't stand the situation any longer. Paul was deeply concerned and could not cope with the fact that since he'd been torn away from them, he had not received any news about them. He simply had to find out how they were doing and what was going on. Once more, we see genuine concern. His mind is constantly drawn back to them despite his busy life as an apostle. He receives letter upon letter, but none of them from the Thessalonians, and he knows that he simply must act in order to find out how they are faring. And so, in deep love and concern, he sends Timothy, and at great personal cost to himself, he is willing to be left alone in Athens just so he can hear about the Thessalonians and send them encouragement. And having sent Timothy off, he must have been, had a period of anxious waiting in Athens. What news? would Timothy return with and, and how had the Thessalonians fared without him? In verses 6 to 10 we see Timothy's report, Paul's reaction and the result this had on Paul's ministry. Here we see Paul's pastoral heart and, and what it teaches us about the value of true fellowship in the body of Christ. So first Timothy's report, what news did Timothy bring? Well in verse 6 we read, but well, Timothy has just come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us 
and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. So Timothy brought good news. This is the only time in the New Testament, by the way, that this term is used when it doesn't refer to the gospel. In terms of their relationship with God, they're continuing to stand firm in the Lord, as verse 8 will also indicate. Their faith was holding firm despite all the pressures that they were facing. In the face of many forms of opposition, these young believers were showing all the important signs of genuine faith. Further, Paul also received news of their love which clearly included their pleasant memories of Paul's earlier visit. Paul had made no secret of the fact that he longed to see them, but it must have been a tremendous to hear the news that they longed to see him as well. So there was mutual encouragement, mutual appreciation of each other. We see this more fully as we consider, secondly, Paul's reaction. In verses 7 to 8 we read, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live, since you are standing firm in the Lord. On hearing this news, Paul himself is encouraged. Even though the primary purpose of sending Timothy was to encourage them and to strengthen them, the result was that Paul received encouragement. So Paul's pastoral ministry was marked by mutual encouragement as he shared his life with the believers and they shared their lives with him. Though Paul was the experienced apostle, he also at times needed encouragement from from them. And so, having heard that they were standing firm, it gave him a new lease of life after a period of long anxiety. Whilst there was no news, his life was in some ways on hold, like someone wearing results for himself or for a loved one. But then when eventually the news came through, Paul seemed to breathe a sigh of relief and joy. And then he got on with his life with renewed passion. He set about his task with renewed zeal. So finally we see the result of Timothy's report. In verses 9 to 10 we read, How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Paul concludes by describing how the news had drawn him back to God in thankfulness and joy. Paul began his letter with thanksgiving to God for their faith, their love and their hope. And this had been enriched by Timothy's report, which had provided even more reasons for thankfulness. So from a situation where Paul has no news and and is anxious about them and sends Timothy because he could stand no longer, we now see Paul overflowing with joy and thankfulness. We see the richness of fellowship that there is between those united to Christ, or at least there should be. In Christ, believers have a fellowship which is able to provide mutual encouragement in the faith as life is shared together. In these verses we see Paul's pastoral heart, his deep concern and compassion for the believers in Thessalonica. As we consider these verses, we can also draw out several lessons that should encourage and challenge us about our appreciation of and contribution to our fellowship here in First Pope Nolan. Firstly, throughout this passage there is evidence of the deepest love between Paul and the Thessalonian believers. Rather than being emotionally detached, Paul is completely engaged with them even though physically absent. His focus is on people and their need for the gospel and being, being built up in Christ. For Paul it is all about relationships with Christ with new believers, with fellow gospel workers, and with non-Christians. People matter to God, people matter to Paul because they matter to God, so they should matter to us too. So do we really care about each other? And what are we doing to show it? Folks, I've been really uh, encouraged and really blessed as as of Caroline and I, uh, and the boys, by how much you care for us. The love that you show to us in your prayers, in your fellowship and practically as well. Can I encourage you to keep doing that and find new ways of doing that with each other as a fellowship, as a church, but also think about the many ways in which we can reach out to share God's love too. Let's continue to be a a fellowship which displays and shows the love of God because we know the love of God in our hearts. So secondly, in this passage we see the importance of true fellowship Paul and the Thessalonians encouraged each other in their faith as they shared their lives together, as those united 
through Christ and each other. Likewise, everyone within our church, uh, church family should use every opportunity to encourage each other, including those with leadership responsibilities. We really are all in this together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Nobody stands alone, not Albert, not myself, not the Kirk Session, not the committee, not our youth leaders or the leaders of other organisations. We are to care for each other, we are to encourage each other, and we're to bear each other's burdens and pray for each other. So again, can I encourage you to fellowship and care for each other? So let's turn then secondly to consider Paul's pastoral prayer. Before anyone can buy a house, they're usually required, or at least advised, to obtain a surveyor's report. A surveyor's report is concerned with the condition of the house and any potential areas of concern about the state of the building. Hopefully it will reveal that the house is in good condition, but there may be particular problem, problems highlighted in the report, report which require attention. Some may be more pressing than others, but it's always helpful to be able to get a report in order to assess what needs to be done on a more order. In Paul's survey of the Thessalonian church family, he has found that there's much that is good, much that is in good working order, in particular we see this in chapter 1. However, there are a number of key areas which do require attention. It is in these areas where there are shortcomings that now are highlighted by Paul's prayer for the believers in Thessalonica. As we consider verses 10 to 13, we see three particular areas of concern. Firstly, Paul prays for consistent faith in verses 10 to 11. We read, <clears throat> night and day, uh, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and again supply what is lacking in your faith. Now we may now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. <clears throat> this first appeal is extremely straightforward. He prays that our God would enable him and his companions to be able to return to the believers in Thessalonica in order to supply what is lacking in their faith. Though Paul has already given thanks to God for their faith, which has already been evidenced in various ways, nevertheless he is aware that there are some obvious gaps which need filling. As we'll see in the coming verses and chapters, these gaps didn't really relate to their knowledge of their faith, but rather in their application of their faith to everyday life. In the area of sexual relationships, there, is little evidence, uh, there was a little evidence, certainly amongst some of the church believers, that their faith in Christ had a little impact on that particular area of their lives. So Paul prays that he'll be able to visit and specifically deal with some sorts of issues. He longs for a consistent faith, which has worked out across the whole of these new believers' lives. He wants the, the gospel to apply to every single aspect of their lives, not just the bits that suited them. Secondly, Paul prays for a comprehensive love. In verses 12, in verse 12 we read, May the, the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. While Paul has already given thanks for their love, he has also detected there's something lacking. His prayer is therefore a desire that their love for others around them, all around them, would increase and overflow, and that it would be evident amongst both the church and the wider Thessalonian community. This picture of love increasing and overflowing is ultimately modelled on God's love for the Thessalonians, which had led to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for them. Again, the love of God for believers should provoke in them a love that is deep and wide, a love that is looking out as well as looking within. Sec uh, uh, thirdly, finally, Paul's prayer, Paul prays for continuing hope. In verse 13 we read, May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all his holy ones. Faith, hope and love, these three things always seem to go together. Although the word is not actually used, the theme of Christian confidence concerning the future is very evident in this final petition. Paul has already given thanks for their endurance, inspired by their hope in our Lord Jesus, but amongst, uh, but amongst such, some, such confidence was waning. As a result, Paul prays for the strengthening of their hope, that they would keep going amidst persecution and bereavements, 
until the day when the Lord Jesus Christ would return. It is a prayer that they would keep going and not be discouraged despite all the pressures and opposition they face. Their hope is in Christ and they look forward one day to his glorious and victorious return. In these verses, we see Paul's prayer for a young church under pressure so they may grow in maturity and be able to withstand all other assaults that may come. And from this prayer, we learn several lessons that apply to our own situation to today. Firstly, we should ponder this question and this set of questions. If the apostle were to conduct a survey of our lives, where would he find gaps and deficiencies? Where are we lacking? Where would he fill, where would he need to fit, uh, need to supply what is lacking? Only by meditating on God's word, seeking the spirits, guiding and being open with our fellow believers, will we be able to truly answer these questions and respond accordingly. We must always put our lives under the microscope of the gospel, but in the context of grace and fellowship. Secondly, we must consider Paul's calling to love others in the way Christ loved us. It is relatively easy to show love to those around us or to those who are like us, but our love is to be much more indiscriminate. It is to be for everyone. The challenge is for us that we should take every opportunity to show love within our church and the surrounding community. Christ's love for us should be a spur for us to be far more proactive so that through us many others would experience the love of Jesus Christ. That love for us should provoke us to show that love to others. And again, we need to be creative and wise about how we show that love, especially in these days where there are lots of opportunities in a post or a, during a COVID world. Practically and spiritually, we can show great care. We can show the gospel to those around us. Finally, like Paul, let us use every means to encourage each other forward in the Christian life to greater Christ-likeness. In particular, however, let us pray for one another and do so in an informed and consistent way. Notice that Paul's prayers for the believers are always that they would move on with Christ, but they're very specific and they're very thought through. They're, they're, they are about the, the actual issues that particular believers are facing. Before writing to them, Paul had been praying for the believers, and this should be an encouragement for us to make prayer a priority. We should be at prayer and in prayer for those around us, our brothers and sisters. We live in a difficult world in lots of different ways, but especially spiritually, we need to uphold each other in prayer. And again, I want to encourage you that it's been a massive encouragement and blessing to, to me and, and our family for all the prayers that we've received in recent weeks. And we we encourage you to pray, not just for us, but, but for Albert uh, and for, for the eldership and for so many areas of our, our church. We need to be praying for these areas that God would guide and bless us for his glory. So as we conclude, in our passage we have seen that Paul's pastoral heart and Paul's pastoral prayer. As we read of Paul's love for the believers and how he prays for them, we see that being part of the church involves rich relationships which should provide encouragement and support as we live for Christ. And we've also seen that growth and development should be the norm for the Christian life. Believers must be praying for and fellowshiping with each other as we seek to live for Christ. We are called to remember that we all need the church and each other. So let us be, let us as believers today, Never forget that the Christian faith is about pursuing Christ and holiness together through prayer and fellowship. And let us seek God's help in this today and every day. So let us pray. Father God, we do thank you for the gift of the church. Christ's bride. Your, your way of gathering your people together under your word, under your grace to grow in Christ-likeness and to display to the world around us the glory of the gospel. Father, we pray that we would take every opportunity, every service of worship, every midweek, every prayer meeting, every small group, every opportunity to gather with believers and to fellowship under your word and in prayer. Father, please build us up in these days to be a people of love and faith and hope. We display your love, your faithful in truth 
and we have a hope which is beyond this world that points to you and your greatness. Father, please bless us in the days to come and help us to be a blessing for our good and your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. So thank you again for joining with us. Um, we, we encourage you again to be in prayer, whether physically or via Zoom, and encourage you to join with us. We hope to see you there. Take care and God bless.